Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Steady Focused. I'm your host. I'm your number one, Mr. Simeon Hendricks. On today's episode, get ready because we are going to shake the earth with this interview. We are sitting down with a man known simply as Sandro. He's multiple times been awarded International Photographer of the Year, multiple times been voted one of the top 200 advertising photographers of the world. At the Cannes Lions International Festival, he has been acknowledged as the best new director. In 2001, Sandro was invited by the Cuban government to photograph their athletes. And this project, his project, was the first U.S.-Cuban collaboration since the diplomatic and trade embargo was imposed in 1960. Now, now just think about that, guys. Sandro has photographed many national advertising campaigns for clients such as BMW, Milk, Adidas, Nike, Nikon, Pepsi, so many more. His editorial work has been featured in Communication Arts, Esquire, Forbes, Time, Wired. He is exhibited worldwide. He's known for his powerful images and close work with John Malkovich. Guys, <laughs> when I say that today's show is an absolute honor and we are on the line with one of the greats, it's an understatement. Please help me give a big, steady, focused welcome to my friend, Mr. Sandro. show, Sandro. Good morning, sir. Well, thank you so much, Simeon. That was such a really beautiful, kind introduction. It almost made me tired <laughs> to think to think <laughs> about all that stuff that, uh, that I've Man. done. But thank you very much. That was really beautiful. And you've lived it. Yes, I have. Wow. Happy Valentine's to you, sir. You got big plans for the day? Well, um, I, I hope to, to get my wife into bed. Uh, that would be probably on my top priority. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right on. Cool. <laughs> Make a little love. Uh, but we're actually, I'm, I'm actually off to, to Oslo, Norway today to open up uh, an exhibition, uh, my Malkovich exhibition, Homage to the Masters. And tomorrow night at the opening will be the first time that all 63 images have been shown under one roof. As uh, I just completed uh, a couple of months ago, the the last sitting, the last homage sitting with John, which we recreated another 23 images. So it's oh been a, uh, a quite a busy schedule, um, but it's all good. Well, um, Sandro, please, for some of the listeners out there, let's just start right there. For, th for those who may not know about this project and this homage project that you're doing with John Malkovich, what is it and how did this even come about? Well, uh, Malkovich, 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 homage to the masters really came about, <clears throat> it, was, it was a period that I went through about six years ago, and I had come down with a stage four cancer. And it was, you know, it was one of those moments, I was on the fence, I really didn't know whether I was going to make it or not, um, you know, hoping and, and praying that I was going to make it through it. But I had some thoughts that came to my mind that if I was to return and, and, and get back to my work, I wanted to take some time to virtually say thank you to the master photographers that have inspired me, influenced me, and made me who I am today, the photographer that I am today. You know, there's so many greats like Avedon, Arbus, Penn, Watson, Leibowitz. Uh, you know, it, it, it goes on and on and on. And all of these people have created what I would call, are called iconic images, images that they are known all over the world through. And I could just close my eyes while I laid in bed ill. I could close my eyes and these images could come to me because they've been embedded in my brain. I've seen them so many times. I've, I've looked for inspiration from them. I've seen them in galleries, museums, books. Um, and they've just really been a huge part of my life and my career. And I thought the way that I could say thank you to these great, great masters was to recreate down to the most 
infinite little detail uh, of their images and recreate it in, in my images. And after two years of researching these images and dissecting them and truly going deep into detail and even Googling, you know, where it was done, when it was done, what time of day it was done, what camera it was done with, what types of film were used, what they were doing at the time, who may have been present in the room. Uh, we did all this in extensive research. And uh, once I got to the point where I felt very comfortable, I went to go visit my friend in the south of France, John Malkovich, whom I've been working with for, you know, probably close to 20 some years at that time. And we've just become very close and we've done a lot of great work together. And I had a, such a confidence level that John was my man to be my muse as the subject of all of these recreations. And when John saw the project, John went absolutely nuts. He just loved it. And he looked at me and he goes, we're going to play theater together because that's what this is for me. I'm going to become every single one of these characters and we're going to play it just like, it was, like we're doing a theater. And the project went on to have international recognition and it's been showing for close to three years now through galleries, museums, and different institutions. And it's just been one of those you know, projects for me that was really part of my cure. It gave me something to think about, something to do, something to look forward to. And the whole process, process of recreating these images to such infinite detail, really, for me, when, when, I, when I finally got well from cancer, I told myself I didn't want to do any mediocre work. Everything I wanted to do had to be of the utmost quality with the highest potential that I could give any project at all. And that was the first one right out of the box that I did. And so became very successful and we've been celebrating it for three years and I'm off to Oslo and Budapest uh, tomorrow and next week off to Budapest to open up the exhibition. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. So Sandra, what, you know, now that you're at this vantage point in your career, in your life, near death, now you're back and healthy and, and just doing great work. What, what in your, in your eyes, in your mind, are passion projects important to an artist as in these projects that might immediately not pay uh, a great sum of money, but they are enriching to oneself as an artist. How important do you think they are if they are important? Well, well Simeon, for me, it's, this is an easy answer. There's, they are the most important work an artist will ever, ever, ever do. And especially a photographer. And, and, and especially a photographer who's making his money commercially because that commercial work will eventually dry up. You will not produce, you know, with the, uh, the strong passion that you had maybe in your 20s and 30s. You know, I'm close to 60 now. You begin to lose the strive to do you know, another commercial project, you know, even though the money, we do the commercial work truly for the money. Mm -hmm. We do the passion projects, the personal projects for our heart and for our art. And for me, it has been the personal work that has kept me on the top of the game in the commercial world, because it's my, my personal project that wins all the awards. It gets the recognition and keeps me in the eyes and in the ears of these creative directors around the world. You know, I always think to myself, you know, when that day does come and I am no longer here and I look back at my career, what am I going to most be proud of? You know, shooting a campaign for Coca-Cola and McDonald's, a BMW, Mercedes, or is it going to be the work that came truly from within me, from my heart, from my soul, from my passion that I did without anybody directing me at all on how to do the project. It was my idea. I executed it the way I wanted to execute it. And then I shared it with the world. Now, not every project's got to be as successful as Melkovich, Melkovich, Melkovich. 
and and you know and a lot of my projects are are very successful some of them you know they really don't resonate with the crowds but that doesn't matter because it resonates with me mm -hmm. it gave me a you know it, it what it did is it took care of a curiosity that i may have had about something a subject or a uh, something political that I needed to say, whatever it was, I did it for myself. And I think it's the most important work that any of us could do is to do that personal passion work. Hey Amen. That just, yeah, it almost brings me to tears. I mean, it's like, yeah, it is what it's about. It's about that. It it, it's about, you know, whether it's the universe or God or, or whatever someone thinks, but it's this thing greater than me is placed in my heart. And yeah, I, I got to give it a voice. Yeah, it, so, it, exactly. Sam. And that's exactly how I feel. You know, we have these ideas, things come to us wherever they do. You know, I get inspired and influenced from so many things. It could be poetry. It could be from a child's book. It could be from a cover of a book. It could be a, a line in, in a novel. Uh, you know, I go to museums and galleries, institutions, lectures all the time. You know, our, our, our new generations are spending too much time on the cell phones and the computers, and they're not going out to experience the experience. Mm. You know, they, they feel like they've seen the exhibition when they see it on their phones or their computers, you know, but you, you're not, you really can't see the vision of the artist unless you see it in person. And the biggest thing with, they're losing is the communication with you know, maybe that person that's right next to you looking at that same piece you're looking at and you just both look at each other and then questions or a discussion arises. Mm -hmm. And we're not able to do that when we're sitting at home on our cell phones or our computers looking at projects like this here. Mm -hmm. It's so important that, you know, we continue to go out and experience theater, music, uh, poetry slams. Uh, it's just, this is where inspiration, true inspiration comes from. Great ideas are not going to come from your cell phone. They, you really got to get out there and experience life. Open your eyes, smell it, let your heart beat and become part of the world. Become what's part of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Sandro, take us back to Illinois, 1958. What was, what was Sandro like as a young boy? What was your home life like and your early life like? What was going on? What were you seeing? Yeah. Well, my mom was, she came over uh, on the boat into Ellis Island uh, in the early 50s. <clears throat> and she had, a, she had a very, very, very difficult 20s. She had married um, a, a man and they had a child. And, uh, and a very unfortunately... Um, her first husband went off on a hunting trip and was uh, was killed in this in this hunting accident. And then about three four months later, her first child their their child together uh, passed away with what they would call crib death. She remarried. She remarried my my father. Excuse me. Um, you know, a couple of years later, she was a young lady. She was you know working in a factory called the Elgin Watch Factory. She met my father, and they had three children. I was the oldest uh, of the three children. And very unfortunately, my father was killed in an automobile accident uh, four years later. So at the age of four, I became, you know, almost the man of the house. You know, my, my mom was going through some of the most difficult time of her life. You know, she had had two husbands and a baby taken away from her before she was even 28 years old. So there was definitely, you know, um, some depression, some, you know, a, a very, very, very broken heart. But my mother still gave uh, us kids a tremendous amount of love. So we lived very, very, very modestly. You know, my mom um, had to quit work to, to really to raise the kids. And uh, I, I never felt as if I was poor because my mom was just a wonderful Italian cook and she could make uh, an amazing dish out of everything. But it was, you know, it was raised by a single mom in struggling times. Um, there was absolutely no introduction to art into my world until really until I got into uh, junior high school where we started taking art classes. And uh, 
but I would go home and there'd be no discussion of art. My mom knew very little uh, about art. So it had to be something that came f- out of me. And, and I think the fact that we had such a dysfunctional home with, you know, our father being uh, killed in a car accident at such an early age and me having to take responsibility as the oldest, biggest brother, that something in me clicked that I needed to be a creator. I needed to, to make art. I needed to meet people and, and, and photograph people. And I remember I was at the age of 16 years old. I had bought a, a copy of American Photography. And I'm not sure why. You know, I, the only thing I can think of is it probably had a half-naked woman on the cover. <laughs> I probably right. said, okay, I'm going to pick up this magazine and yeah. take a look inside. Yeah. And inside there were these portraits of, uh, of Irving Penn. And it was the pivotal point of my whole life when I opened up and saw these portraits that Penn did of Picasso and the French theater actress Celeste. I mean, they were raw, they were gritty, they were deeply, darkly lit. I didn't know who Picasso was, I didn't know who Celeste was, I didn't know who Irving Penn was. But my curiosity was so high at that point of wanting to know who these people were that um, by the end of the day, you know, I researched all of them. And I also knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to take pictures, I wanted to take photographs of people that people wanted to know more about these people. And that was the pivotal point my whole life. It was seeing those Irving Penn photographs. Wow. And so, you know, you, you start putting in the work, you're, you're building, you're growing, you're advancing. At what point do you have a thought or, or do you even have this thought? And you say, my gosh, I've made it, or I'm making it, you know, do you ever get awestruck or just step back and think, Wow, you know, look at what I've done. Well, you know, I, I, I don't think I really do that. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've been told, you know, the, the accomplishments I've had are, are great. And, you know, you win the, the awards, which uh, solidifies that you have done good work. But in this field, I just don't feel there's uh, time to really sit back and go, Wow, I'm really great. I'm really wonderful. There we you go. know, I think that that there's so many uh, great photographers out there, and so many people that are making huge advances in our field and really doing incredible projects. That there's just no time to just sit back on what you've done. You've got to continue to move forward and continue to come up with new ideas if you want to stay in the game. And, mm. you know, I'm sure I've provided, I've done the work, you know, at, you know, at some point I would, you know, I think I'll probably consider, be considered somewhat of uh, a photography, photographer's legend. But I, I myself, I feel like I'm 60. I'm really just getting started. Awesome. The ideas just keep on flowing, you know, from my heart, from my, from my brain's and I want to do so, so much more that I feel it's just the beginning. And uh, I think that, you know, maybe when I'm in my 80s, 90s, um, I'll be able to take that time and look back at my career and go, yeah, that was a good career. I had a lot of fun and I did some good work. For me, it's all about, you know, right now what I'm, I'm into is doing the work. You know, I do some teaching. I, I love passing my knowledge forward passing my experiences forward and trying to inspire and influence, you know, our new generations to, uh, you know, to think about the idea, you know, what are you doing out there with your cell phone? If, if your cell phone is your tool, you know, which is fine. You know, if that's what you want to be your camera, that's fine. I'm, I'm not really big on it. I think you should go out and get yourself a camera and really, dive into what photography is all about, you know, F-stops, shutter speeds, ISOs, and be able to have to make some decisions instead of just point and shoot. Yeah. But the biggest thing about it is having an idea. Mm. You know, what am I out there? What am I pointing my camera at? Why am I pointing my camera at this here? What's my message? What do...
you were. You know, not just quit snapping shots, throwing them on Instagram, and you have no idea what they're there for. And just contributing to the billion plus images that get posted mm. a day that mean nothing. So I think it's really important for everybody to just start think about what they're shooting and really have an idea behind it. Along those lines and your inspiration in, in a, a series that I've been inspired by of yours, who, or for the listeners that may not know, who or what is Steppenwolf? And how has that been, uh, you know, part of your, your portfolio? Uh-huh. Well, Steppenwolf is, is a theater based out of Chicago, and it's often been written as uh, probably the best theater company in the world. I mean, it has produced a lot of, you know, a lot of stars, Gary Sinise, Jeff Perry, John Malkovich, Joan Allen, uh, you know, John, John Mahoney. The list really goes on and on and on of the people that have been up on that stage performing to live audiences. And it's based here out of Chicago. And about 25 years ago, you know, I got the call to be Steppenwolf's photographer that would, you know, create their, first their ensemble portraits, their playbills, um, all their advertising campaigns. And the whole theme behind Steppenwolf is, is really quite raw. You know, they approached me because of my raw look. You know, I had a very, back 25 years ago when I started, I had a very gritty, black and white look, and it really just fit who Steppenwolf was. And uh, so I, for 25 years, got to create some really great, great, great images for this theater company. But the best, the biggest and the best thing that came out of that was my introduction and meeting John Malkovich, who, again, we became really close, dear friends. He became probably my, you know, most sought after muse. And uh, and John's okay. He he knows that he's my muse, and it's okay to call him my muse. But he has been in front of my camera just hundreds of times, and we have created some very interesting work, uh, stills and films. And it's been the work that has gotten a, a lot of internet international recognition, and it's a lot of this work has put me on the map. So you know, you never know uh, in in this world when somebody asks you to be part of something, you know, Steppenwolf was never, it was never for the money. You know, you, you, you know, a commercial photographer can't take every job that they do and, it's, and, it's, and they have, and they can't be thinking about the bottom line. They can't be thinking about the money because okay. so often so many other good things can come from a photo project. You know, it's mm. don't always look at the bottom line money. Look at whom you might be introduced to look at the long lasting relationships that you may have. So I think it's always mm. very important. You know, the other thing that I really, you know, try to preach to the young is to take on great charity work, take on great, great pro bono work, because first of all, you're giving back to community. You're able to help out a cause, you know, instead of reaching into your wallet and writing a check, you know, donate your talent, donate your photography, you know, whether it's to a, a blind foundation, a, a food, uh, uh, depository, an orphanage, uh, an AIDS program, whatever it might be, find these charities and these foundations that need help, that need a photographer, and and get out there and do the work for them because karma will come back tenfold and you will get so much more out of that work than what you're giving. Mm. There you go. I mean, that you can just take that last few sentences and, and this whole um, interview is is just value just on that alone. Yeah. I love that you said that just like that. Yeah. Thank you. S Sandra, what what do you say are some of the big mistakes or the big moments in your career when maybe your I like to say your stomach dropped. You're you're in you're shooting maybe you're with uh I don't know, you've shot with Michael Jordan or Muhammad Ali and and something goes wrong and it's like, "Oh my gosh." You know, I, I just like to to kind of shine the light on the great and then give hope to the aspiring to say, hey, they're human as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. they've lived through this. They've yeah. they've missed the uh, the aperture or whatever. Sure, sure. You know, you're you're right. We, we are all human. We all make mistakes. Um, you know, I, could, I, I guess my word of advice is to that is because I can't really 
I honestly can't say I can remember where I've gone back and, and, and absolutely blown a shoot. And the reason why that hasn't happened is because I do my homework. You know, I do the work before the shoot. I've got everything figured out before my talent steps on onto my set. And that may be sometimes I do it weeks ahead of time, uh, a couple of days at a time, the day before, but I'm always super, super, super prepared. I surround myself with really great, great crew. You know, everybody needs to be on top of their game. Every, you know, put the cell phones down, everybody concentrate on what's going on here right now, because really there isn't any room for mistakes. You know, you, you get one chance, you get one chance to have a Muhammad Ali in front of your camera. You may have three minutes to have Michael Jordan in front of your camera and you've got to be prepared. I mean, have I always been 100% happy with the results that I've gotten? Have I not, you know, maybe reached the fullest potential of what I could have done? Yes, but never have I given an editor something that they have not uh, been very, very happy with. And it all comes down to just doing the homework, taking your time beforehand, setting up, knowing exactly what you're going to do and have backups already in order. You know, if something doesn't seem to be working, have another background up, have all your lenses ready, have another idea in place just in case, you know, faces change, skin tones change. The attitude of your sitter may not be what you thought it was going to be. So you have to be prepared. And by doing the homework, having prep, you know, done all the preparation, you're going to be able to have something else to fall back on. And a lot of this comes with experience. You know, for the, for the newer, younger photographer, first thing I can say is just really, you got to have the confidence that you could do what you're going to do. So many of us go into life, into a job, thinking that our potential is at arm's reach, when truly our potential is, is the sky. It's just that we need to be challenged. And when we're challenged, we're able to tap into this knowledge that we didn't think we had or this potential we didn't think we had. You know, challenge yourself, drop the fear, know that you could do it and prepare yourself at all times. Drop the fear. That to hear you say, you know, I'm I'm taking it as you're talking straight to me and I'm 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 owning it. And it reminds me of I was talking to my seven year old son who just started mm -hmm. basketball and he was mm -hmm. telling me, dad, I'm, I'm afraid of getting hit in the face with the ball. And I was just telling sure. him like, come on, no fear. You can do this. And talking to the seven-year-old, it's easy for me to say that to him, but hearing you say that to me, it's, it's the exact same thing. Like no fear, just do it. Well, what happens is, you know, your boy is eventually going to get hit in the head with the ball and he's going to find out, you're going to find, okay, that hurt a little bit, but I'm okay. You know, and for us photographers, we're going to find that maybe we didn't pull off the shot that we would have liked to have pulled off. Or you're going to have an editor at some point in your career who's just going to say, you know, Sandro, this is not exactly what I was looking for. But guess what? We're human. We're going to get up the next day. We're going to continue on. You know, and, and sometimes lessons like that are the best lessons we could receive is, you know what? I didn't give it my full. What happened to me that day? Was I, was I there a hundred percent or was I lacking? Did I not show up? You know, and you're going to learn from that lesson that every shoot, I don't care if it's for, if it's costing you money or if you're getting paid $200,000 to do it, you got to show up at 200% and give your client everything. Mm. Have the ideas in your head, know where you're going to take it and have backups. And you will be successful. Wow. Sandro, sir, that's, that's what I've got. I mean, that, um, I appreciate your time so much. And I know, like you're saying, you're about to take a jet and fly across the country, across the world. Um, I just want to give the floor to you. Anything else you'd like to say or um, anything that's on your heart? Well, first, I just want to say thank you very much for having me on and letting me be able to share my story to your listeners. And I just tell your listeners, to believe in yourself, truly, you know, I I feel I've been doing this for forty years, and photography has been some part of my life every single day. 
whether I'm taking a picture, going to a museum, institution, or gallery, or if I'm picking up a, a book, you know, I, in my collection, I've got over a thousand photography books. So I'm, maybe I'm picking up a book. Uh, I'm picking up a photography magazine from around the world. I, I, you know, don't pick up only magazines that are here in the States. Find out what's happening over in, in Amsterdam, in the, in the Netherlands, in Germany, uh, in France. See what they're doing over there. But make photography a, a small part of your life every single day. You know, put a couple of magazines by the toilet. Everybody's got to go to the toilet and spend a couple minutes there, <laughs> yeah. you know. So pick up a, that magazine, read, read an article, look at some photographs, get inspired, believe in yourself, have passion and love for what you're doing, and you will succeed. Sandra, if people want to find you online, look at your portfolio or follow you, how can they, how can they find you? Yeah, the website is sandrofilm, F-I-L-M dot com, sandrofilm dot com. There's an area there that they can contact me. Uh, they can also follow me on Instagram. Uh, I'm an open book. And uh, if they'd like to reach out to me via my email, please do so. All that contact is on the website. Um, you know, I receive uh, wishes and questions from all over the world. And like I said, you know, after being in this business for 40 years and being able to celebrate a great career, um, I love to be able to inspire and influence uh, the young to follow their dreams. Wow. And you've absolutely done that today, sir. And we appreciate you so much for coming on. And thank you. Very welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. Guys, I hope you have found value out of this interview. And keep tuning in because we're going to keep giving it to you. So until next time, I'm your host. I'm your number one, Mr. Simeon Hendricks. And this is Steady Focused. Thank you.